continuing in our uh, January-February sermon series entitled Big Bible Words. We're trying to make sense of some of those big words we've, we've seen, we've recognized, we've read, heard about all these years, but we, we may just not know what they mean. We're trying to make right definition of some of these. And in the last couple of weeks, we've covered the following, the word redemption, which uh, means purchase from slavery, the penalty of sin given a new life through Christ. We talked about justification just a few weeks ago, which means legally declared innocent. Because of Christ's work on the cross, we are forgiven, pardoned, exonerated. It's as simple as that. Last week we talked about sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit poured out on us to make us holy, to set us apart like priests set apart for holy work. Now uh, all of these are good news words, aren't they? Uh, this morning is no different. We're going to look at another good news word, but probably the hardest word to understand and the hardest word for me to say. Propi propitiation. It's on the screen. Take a look at it. <laughs> propitiation. You try it. Say it. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it's found only three times in only the King James Version of the Bible, but it is a powerful Bible word. Describing something often historically very ugly. But for us, and for what, is God, what God has done for us, something very beautiful. Propitiation is as hard to understand as it is to pronounce. A couple weeks ago, I decided to ask Siri on my smartphone. Siri, define propi propitiation. Look, uh, if you have a smartphone, I want you to take it out right now. Would you take it out right now and, and ask it, say, define propitiation. Turn it up so we can hear it. Do that right now. Don't be shy. Go ahead. What did you come up with? I tried it over and over. This is what it said to me. <laughs> Pro pitchy Asian. What's even stranger, it recommended websites to visit. <laughs> Propitiation. The action of propitiating. That was helpful. Or of appeasing a God, a spirit, a person. From the King James Version, Romans 3.25, the Apostle Paul, speaking of Jesus whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Did you get that? Does it even make sense to you? Let's look at it again. Propitiation. A religious rite in which an object is offered to a divinity in order to establish, maintain, or restore a right relationship of a human being to the sacred order. It is a complex phenomenon that has been found in the earliest known forms of worship and in all parts of the word, world. Simply put, propitiation describes the act of offering sacrifices to appease the gods, to keep the gods from being angry, vengeful, wrathful with us. It's about trying to gain favor by giving the gods something costly, like a bowl, like a bowl of fruit, or a child. We first see it in the scripture in Acts chapter 4. I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 4. Cain and Abel offering uh, sacrifices to God. And Cultures around the world have been doing the very same thing ever since. I want to show you 
some pictures of sacrifice. This first is troublesome. This is an uh, artist's rendering of what happened in antiquity. In Canaan, this is not Jewish worship, but Amorite, Ammonite, Hittite worship. There was a god that they worshipped called Molech. The body of a man, the head of a bull. And part of the propitiation to the god Molech, oh, please be happy with us. Please avert crisis, famine, war. What did Molech demand? Their firstborn infant. They, would build, they built this statue. It was hollow. They built a fire inside of it. It was blazing. And they assembled in the Valley of Hinnom, which means the Valley of the Beating of Drums. These Canaanite priests would pound on these drums to drown out the side of a child being thrown into the flames. Thousands and thousands of children sacrificed in the flames to the god Molech. In uh, Jewish times, there was uh, a different form of sacrifice. Now, it wasn't sacrificing babies or infants, but, but two types. There, you, you'll see pictures of this. I think this is a picture of a, of a, a vase. You'll see it in hieroglyphics in Egypt. You, you'll see it across cultures, Aztec, Indians, um, offering two kinds. The first kind was a tenth, a tithe. This is largely Jewish in nature. They, uh, they would take a tenth of their flock, a tenth of their oil, a tenth of, the, tenth of their produce, uh, a tenth of their wealth, and they would offer it to God as an as a offering of thanksgiving. Then there were the blood sacrifices, called a blood atonement. It could be a bull, it could be a cow, it could be a number of clean animals, according to the Jewish faith, uh, a lamb, and they would offer it to the priest on the altar where he would cut its throat, cut it to pieces, burn the flesh, and the blood would drain down into the altar and down into a gutter. The blood sacrifice of the Jews was an attempt to appease God, to ask him to not take note of our sins. It was asking, it was our way of showing our, to, to try to make amends for our sin through this blood sacrifice. The, um, the principal sacrifice, and you know this, of Jewish sacrifice for years and years and years was the spotless lamb. A man would find a, a little lamb, perfect, no spot, no blemish, no disease, and um, he and his family would journey with that little lamb to the temple, and it would be, it would be uh, offered there. That lamb would have been both a costly and a heartbreaking sacrifice to make. It was also a foreshadowing of Jesus, the Lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. I want you to turn in your New Testament to Hebrews. The book of Hebrews, the letter of Hebrews, uh, toward the back of your Bible. It's Hebrews chapter 10, and I rarely do this. I'm going to read it from a translation that you probably don't have with you. It's the Living Bible uh, version, and, and I've chosen it because it's just kind of straightforward. In fact, the, the, the next words aren't going to be on the screen. Just, just listen. The Hebrew writer here is talking about the historic inability of animal sacrifices to take away the sins of people, that the very best we offered fell short. He wrote, the old system of Jewish laws gave only a dim foreshadowing, a dim foretaste of the good things Christ would do for us. The sacrifices under that old system were repeated again and again, year after year, but even so, they could never save those who lived under their rules. If they could have, one offering would have been enough. The worshipers would have been cleansed once and for all, and their feeling of guilt and shame would be gone. The Hebrew writer, let me, let me pause right there. The, the writer here is making the point that instead of Jewish people being more secure in their relationship with God, more, more secure that our sins are taken care of, those yearly sacrifices were only a reminder, you're still in bad shape. You are still a sinner. 
I only overlooked your sins for a while, but here they are again. He goes on, but just the opposite happened. Those yearly sacrifices only reminded them of their disobedient and disobedience and guilt instead of relieving their minds. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats really to take away sins. Now pick up following, following the screen, still the, the, still the, uh, the Living Bible version, verse 5 and 7. That is why Christ said as he came into the world, Oh God, the blood of bulls and goats cannot satisfy you. So you, God, Father, have made ready this body of mine for me to lay as a sacrifice upon your altar. You are not satisfied with the animal sacrifices slain and burnt before you as offerings for sin. Then I said, Jesus, see I have come to do your will, to lay down my life just as the scriptures said that I would. Look at this again. Jesus saying, you have made this body. I have come to do your will to lay down my life. Is the truth about propitiation beginning to dawn on you? The giving of the very best to appease the God. Turn away your wrath. Forgive our sins. Are you beginning to see how this all worked out in Christ? The Apostle Paul wrote this. This is Romans 8, 1 through 3. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a propitiation. To be a sin offering. The old law, the endless bloody parade of sacrifices, the very best we could come up to offer to God fell short. It demanded something else, something more costly, and something that only God could do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering. Look at this word again, propitiation. It means atonement. In fact, in later versions, the old English word would be dropped for atonement, especially that of Jesus Christ. And look at this next word. Atonement means the reconciliation of God and humankind through Jesus Christ. We've known about propitiation for years. If you've grown up in the church, you said it, you memorize it. For God so loved the world that he gave what was so costly as a sin offering for us because we had nothing. And his precious son, Jesus, the most costly gift he could give, poured out his blood on the altar of a Roman cross, and he would make atonement for all of our sins, for all of the world, anyone who would believe. Would you turn? I want to, I want to take our time here. Would you find in your Bible 1 John chapter 2? Toward the end of the New Testament. First John chapter 2, I wish you'd circle this. It's on the screen as well. And he, that is Jesus, is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then Romans 3.25. So important, Romans 3.25. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement, propitiation, 
through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. God did it. God did what we couldn't do. You remember when Jesus was baptized, the very beginning of his ministry, to, uh, to inaugurate his ministry, to really in earnest, earnestness begin it, he went to his cousin, John the Baptist, to the Jordan River. To be baptized by John, Jesus would say later, to fulfill righteousness. And as the crowd parted, as this rabbi stepped down into the water, John the Baptist announced, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. All my life, I understood John to mean it this way. In my own words, I would have said it this way. Look, the most precious thing that God could do, he found his own Lamb. And he's sent his son, and his son is going to take away the sins of the earth, the sins of the world. Right? Right? But what I missed was this. God had to go out and get his own. God had to search for the thing most costly to him because we had nothing, and God has provided the sacrifice for us. The Lamb of God. God gave. God loved. Listen to the Apostle John. These are some of the most beautiful words in all of the New Testament. The purest definition of what God, God's love is. 1 John 4.10 here in his love. Are you looking for love? Are you looking for a definition of love? You want to make sense of what love is? This is it. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's how much he loved. Every week here at Bridge, we share together in the Lord's Supper, a communion service. We'll do that in just a few minutes. The uh, lights will dim, some soft music will play. If you're a guest, some instructions will be on the screen behind me. Week to week, it is our opportunity to journey to the cross, to see him there, to bring our sin our remorse, our repentance to him and leave them there and ask for his blessing and his forgiveness. Each week is an opportunity for us to thank God for sending his son. This morning in your communion meditation, I, I wish you'd understand more fully. I wish you'd even try to voice it. Thank you, God, for giving what I could never have given. And I only have forgiveness because you had to step in. Jesus, thank you that when I was powerless, there was nothing to give in exchange. You gave your life on a Roman cross for my sins. The night he was arrested and then taken to court. The cross was just hours away for him. Jesus met in the upper room with his disciples for what we call the Last Supper. It was the Jewish feast of Passover. He'd kept it with him for some years, and now this would be his last Passover feast. The centerpiece of that meal was the lamb. Do you remember the Exodus? To spare the Jewish people from the loss of their firstborn, they would take a spotless lamb, its blood, and put it on their doorpost. And the Passover angel, the death angel, would go past them, and they would be saved. Jesus was, in reality, the Passover lamb. At that table, he was the Passover lamb. They, they didn't see it. He didn't quite understand it. They didn't understand John's prophecy, but he was. And at that meal, he took those common elements of the meal, the unleavened bread, the, the wine, and he changed it. 
He made it all new. Listen to these words. This is from Matthew 26, 27. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us not forget this morning. Let us not forget during this communion service. Let us not forget that God freely gave his son. Let us not forget that Jesus freely gave himself and his blood poured out for us. And God was appeased. Propitiation was made. How long did Jesus know the cross was coming? How young was he when that realization took hold of him and gripped him with dread and fear? And it was dread. It was fear. Remember, he was human. He was flesh. And when they left the upper room that night, they went to the garden where he prayed to his father in agony. The gospel writers variously say he sweat drops of blood. He was dirty. He was writhing in physical and emotional pain for what he knew was ahead. And after the plan had been laid, the blueprint drawn up in that garden that night, he cried out, Abba. Oh, Papa, if there is any other way at this late hour, oh, let this cup pass from me. Do you see him there? Can you sense his agony? But can we shift our focus? Can we shift our attention to the throne room of God in agony stopping his ears from the cries of his son oh dad please because God knew and Jesus really knew he was the only way the only way and sometime in the very heart of that dark night, Jesus said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. In his book, Written in Blood, Robert Coleman tells this most poignant story. Years ago, there was a little girl about four years old who was dying from a rare disease. And, and um, to her good fortune, her older son, her, I'm sorry, her older brother, two years older, had had that same childhood disease and had beaten it. And so the doctors conferred with the family and they said, we think that if Johnny gives a blood transfusion to his little sister Mary, that she'll live. They had the same uh, blood type, and, and so they were going to do this transfusion. And so they brought the little boy in and tried to explain the best they could what a blood transfusion was. It would be a, a stick, and we're going to take your blood and give it to Mary. And these were back in the days when it was a direct blood transfusion from the donor, from his vein, right into his little sister's arm. And so the doctor looked at the little boy and said, do you think you could give your blood to your sister? The little boy's lip started to tremble, and he said to the doctor, can I think about it for a minute? Got up and slowly walked, sh shuffled really down the hallway while the doctor, the nurses, the f mom and dad looked at him, and he was there by himself for a while, and walked back and his eyes were wet, but he said, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it for my sister. And so they, they put him in a room, and they started the transfusion, and 
he would look over to his little sister Mary and smile, but most of the time he was just staring up into the ceiling or his eyes were closed. And then he, toward the end of the transfusion, he looked to the doctor and said, when do I die? You see, he thought that he was giving all of his blood to his sister. That she would live and he would die. I want to meet that little boy someday. That little boy said, can I think about it? You and I suffer from a disorder called sin. And the only remedy, the only cure, was the blood of Christ. And he gave it all. Poured out and he died. That we could live. Would you pray with me? Father, that you would love us so much to give. We're, we're staggered by the gift, what it cost you, the price you paid, Lord Jesus, that you would surrender yourself to the agony of that cross. We are amazed. And now, Holy Spirit, as we commune together, as we... Um, Honor the Christ because of his great love. Would you fill this room with your presence? Would you speak to us about the loveliness of that great sacrifice? In Jesus' name, amen. We have been redeemed. We have been justified. We have been sanctified. We have been atoned for by the propitiation gift of God, His Son Jesus. That's good news. That is wonderful, wonderful news. And it's news that the Old Testament never saw. They could only hope of one day it would happen. Toward the end of the Old Testament, the prophet Micah was looking back through the court of history and, and he realized that we are no better off in spite of the endless parade of the carcasses of animals. Micah wrote this, Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? With 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then he paused. You can almost feel him pause. And the Lord speaks to this prophet and he writes, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Now we understand that our redemption has been taken care of because of the blood of Christ. We are thrilled about that. It's new knowledge for the church. It's done. It's over. Pardoned. Exonerated. And we'll take that. But what is required of us? Anything? To just receive? To just accept? To just keep rehearsing this good news that we are going to heaven? There's a requirement. Micah wrote about it. Listen, I'm afraid that in the Christian church today, we are spoiled takers. And for all that he's done for us, we give very little. The Apostle Paul would write about it in a very succinct way. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brother and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to 
offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. That's what true and proper worship looks like. Living sacrifices given on the altar of holiness, given on the altar of service and ministry of caring and sharing. This morning, uh, Stacy and I, others will be right over here. If the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you for the very first time, this good news, you mean someone like me could have forgiveness? Oh, it's true. I wonder if you'll believe it to be true. If you would make your way down during this next song, we'd like to talk, pray with you to begin a conversation about what it means to make Christ Lord of your life. Maybe you're here today and you have just been a taker. You recognize it and you thank God for it. You give very little in return. Maybe it's time for us to repent of that sin, that spiritual laziness, and pick up our game. Maybe you need to come this morning right along these steps here and begin a new walk with Christ. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a renewal of your vows to the one who loved you so much. You're welcome today as we sing to come and kneel and pray for someone that you know that needs Christ and his atoning sacrifice. To pray for your church, for your marriage, for your home. You're invited. Why don't you come and pray? And don't hesitate. As the Spirit prompts you, just come as we stand and sing.